Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today I'm really excited to be speaking to former hockey player and now hockey coach, Adam Commons. Adam, welcome to the show. Great to be on here, Dan. Thanks for the invite. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm super excited to be talking all things psychology, uh, field hockey from a from a player's lens, from a from a coach's lens. So thank you so much for giving up some of your time. Now, let's start where we always start. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Adam. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a story because um, as some of, as you know, Dan, I, I'm living in Belgium now, but I, I began my uh, life and an early sporting career uh, in a small town called Urengili. And Urengili is uh, 45 minutes outside of Wagga Wagga, which is... <laughs> Five and a half hours uh, southwest of Sydney in Australia. And, um, you know, I'm a farmer's son and, and one of five children. And, and I, I grew up playing hockey uh, in actually a, a small cow paddock. It was literally a, a paddock with cows in it. And we cut the grass and we started playing hockey there. And, and through my career, I was fortunate enough to rise up and, and end up playing for Australia. I I played in the uh, Olympic Games in Sydney in 2000 where we won a bronze medal. Um, I didn't compete in 2004. I was part of that squad all the way up until uh, just before the Olympic Games. I broke my hand and, and didn't go to Athens where we won gold. So that was um, quite uh, uh, shattering at the time. But um, probably it was a, um, a sliding doors moment, if you like, because after that I um, I decided I would go to Belgium and and play hockey professionally or try to do that and experience what it's like to to live in another country and and I ended up staying in Belgium for a number of years, uh, first as a player and then as a coach and and that's where my international coaching career began. I was given the opportunity to coach the Belgian national team and in that those, that era. Uh, we were ranked around 15 in the world and, and hadn't been to the Olympic Games for 32 years. And uh, we were fortunate enough to, to qualify for the Olympics in Beijing. So I led that team in Beijing. In between, I went back to uh, Australia for six years and I led the Australian women's team at London and, and Rio Olympic Games. And, and after Rio, I reconnected back with Belgium and I've been the, the high performance director here for the last six years. Uh, through a really successful period where our men's team have won the the world championships, uh, the European championships, and the Olympic gold, so uh, a great. Um, I've been really lucky to be involved with such a great uh, uh, team and, and a really forward thinking organisation, and um, I'm really proud to to have been part of that last period. Well, wow, there's so much to unpack here. I don't know where to start. I hadn't realised, I mean, I know how strong Belgium are as a, as a field hockey nation, um, but I hadn't realised the ascendancy had been so 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 quick. I need to brush up, up on my field hockey history there because I, I always thought Belgium were pretty strong, but from what you've, you've told me there, that's not necessarily been the case. So we'll unpack that in a bit, but I, I would like to start with your playing career because I, I think it's always so fascinating when... Uh, coaches have had a strong playing career because they don't go hand in hand necessarily. But yeah. let's just reflect back on your your playing. I mean, this is a sport, the sports site show, so let, so let's unpack the psychological side of your game. I'd like to talk about uh, the psychology of injury in a bit and and Athens and 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 what you experienced and how you coped with that. But give me a mark out of ten for the mental side of your game when you were playing was this a strength and and you know in terms of that mark why so high what was good and what could reflecting back what could you have done even better oh it's a difficult question to answer I've never been asked something like that and, <laughs> and look I'm gonna put somewhere in the middle of a of around a seven out of ten and I would give myself a seven out of ten because I was someone that had enormous belief in my own ability. Um, I believed that I belonged on the pitch and that I could really impact the result of the pitch 
with a good performance every time I went out there. I, I didn't really have moments in my career where I started to doubt my ability. And it was not that I was like a, a world-class, world-11 player. In fact, I was a, a player that, that probably only for about two out of the eight years I, I felt comfortable in the team in terms of, uh, you know, I knew I'd be selected. Um, for the, the upcoming tournament. I always believed I should be selected, but um, there was at times some doubts if, if the coaching staff had the same view of myself. So, um, of course, those, those doubts crept in. Um, but I, I wouldn't give myself higher than a seven because there were moments where I think I, I became complacent. Um, I needed competition and I needed... Um, somebody maybe with a bit of a stick uh, behind me to um, to be pushing me to, to get to to my best level. Uh, I was an athlete that had to maybe do a little bit of extra training to try to be right at my physical top. I, you know, I was a, a really good aerobic athlete, but I worked really, really hard at it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a small man. I'm, I'm only 166 centimetres uh, tall. Um, but I, I worked really hard on the physical side of my game. Um, but I, I needed somebody pushing me in that competition to get the best out of me. So um, it, it was not always coming from from within. I needed that competition. And, um, uh, yeah, it's probably something I'll explore later with you. You know, a, a remark a, a psychologist once uh, said to me and that had a sort of profound effect on me at that, that point of my career. And, it, incidentally, it was about 12 months before I retired. But... Um, it made it, uh, yeah. It brought it together, and I, then I started to really appreciate that that mindset factor. I find that really interesting, actually, because let's just pause on that. I mean, it, it sounds to me we talk a lot today about balancing uh, support and stretch, and challenge and support, creating a supportive environment, but also a challenging environment. And and there's always that tension that, Adam, uh, you know, a, a lot of the social media conversation and even the academic conversation at the moment within psychology is around the importance of what, autonomy, supportive coaching, and, and also self-regulation, you know, setting up environments where athletes have the opportunity to self-regulate around things like attention, intensity, uh, uh, confidence confidence, etc. But listening to what you're saying there, it sounds to me like you needed people around you who would continue to push you. And maybe that would be vocally. And maybe that might be through session design as well. Would I be right in saying that? Because I just think there's this tension now. I, I, I'm passionate about autonomy supportive coaching and, and to a certain degree, you know, setting up situations where athletes can self-regulate. But uh, to speak to what you've just said, uh, I just think it's so important for coaches to build the capacity through their session design and through their through their voice, through their communication, through their language skills, and and relationship skills to 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 drive players in the right adaptive way. Yeah, absolutely. I I think the the competitive nature of the squad that we had in leading up to uh, both the Olympic Games in Sydney and in Athens. Uh, drove that as well. We had a squad of 27 players and we knew that only yeah. 16 would go. So you had that competitive nature. But the session design, I believe, is, is a really important factor in in being able to get the best out of your athletes and, and getting them to understand what do we want to get out of this session as well. Um, things have certainly grown since I was an athlete in terms of the, the science and the data that you can get and what other, you know, you know that everything's being measured. So if we need to get a certain amount of high-speed running metres and a certain amount of volume in the session and you don't achieve it, you know you're going to be marked on that. Now, that would have had a huge impact on me as an athlete because, you know, I'd want to be seeing my numbers up there at the top or at least um, being above what what was required of, of me as an athlete. So that that would have really helped me. But it, it we have to, as coaches and as leaders, understand that that doesn't help all athletes. And just because it would have helped me... Um, it could have a real um, stifling effect on some athletes that they know that everything that we're doing will be measured and maybe that stifles their their freedom and creativity of, of, of thought and, and of action. That's really interesting. I'm just writing down their individual differences and maybe we can come back to that. I do want to 
briefly explore your experience um, going into Athens, if you don't mind. You, yeah. you said you had a serious injury and so subsequently didn't uh, get to, 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 to go to the Olympics. Um, how did you... How did you get through that? Did you, did you utilize any psychological support? Was it just something that you had to make your way through yourself? Um, can you can you speak a little bit to that period of time? Yeah, look, we had a lot of psychological support in in, in that moment. A lot. Uh, we we had a psychologist attached to our program. Um, um, I'd I'd known him and had a good relationship with him for for many years, and and I I spoke about the moment. Uh, a year before that where we spoke uh, in depth about my pre-game routine uh, it, it just so happened that I was not in a, in the team and um, and I played for the Australia A side and I had a, a, a this was in 2003 I had a fantastic tournament for Australia A and I was then reselected back in the national team for the major tournament of that year and and whilst we were away on that tour the psychologist asked me um, I heard you had a great tournament for Australia A said, yeah, yeah, played well. Uh, oh, why is that? And I said, uh, yeah, I just really wanted to prove the staff wrong that you know, I, I belonged in the top side. Oh, what did you do different? Well, you know, for the game, I, I got there 15 minutes earlier. I went and found a quiet space. I visualised. I thought about the, the things I needed to do in the game. I had very clear objectives that were linked to my strengths as a player and uh, – and I got myself in a in a really good state uh, of uh, of arousal before the game, and and I really prepared well to go out and put on my best performance. And he looked back at me and he said, "And you weren't doing that when you were playing for Australia." <laughs> and then I said, ah, "You got me there." <laughs> <laughs> and then we worked we worked together on creating a plan for okay, how do I prepare for every international match? Um, after after that session that we had and and what does my pre-match preparation look like how do i uh, get myself in the right mental state to perform out onto the pitch and and to try to replicate what i did before that um that uh that particular tournament where i played for australia a and so that goes to answer your question about the injury leading into athens my relationship with the psychologist was a good one did I lean on him during that moment, uh, probably one of the darkest moments of my career, um, you know, it was career ending in the end because I made a choice afterwards to retire and move towards coaching? And the answer is no. I didn't, um, didn't seek him out. Um, why? You know, maybe that goes to, you know, men thinking they can handle things themselves and that they they will, you know, be a bit afraid to reach out. You know, I'm a farmer's son and, and probably not uh, inclined to ask for help uh, at that time in my life. And that is something that uh, I've gone through a, a pretty big journey in the last six years of my personal development in developing that ability to uh, ask people for help. Regrets from that time, if you could get in a time machine and go back, might you have asked for that help? Yeah, I think so. I think it certainly would have helped um, because, you know, you, you for 10 weeks I was sitting with a, with a finger with uh, wires sticking out of it and, and, you know, you just sort of try to keep yourself physically in shape. You, you're thinking positive in terms of, you know, I'll be back. I was back on the pitch holding a stick two weeks before the first match of the Olympics and I somehow had created a picture in my mind that maybe I would be selected. Love your optimism. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course, you were, I was never in contention. Now being on the other side of it as a coach, uh, you know, I was never in contention um, and, and not even in the conversation. But, um, you yeah, that probably that optimistic thinking maybe... Uh, uh, got me through that period, and 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 afterwards, look, I um I I, I moved to to Belgium actually, uh, and I was in Belgium when, when the first match was played, and um of the games, and uh, and I quickly moved on to the next next part of my my life at um and playing in Belgium and and concentrating on coaches. So certainly, if I had of like. Um, reached out to our psych. I know that he, he would have given me some tools to handle 
handle it a bit better than I did at the time. But um, yeah, I'm pragmatic in my approach when I look at things in the past, and you know maybe it's led to where I am today. And so your coaching career in Belgium started, and I'm I'm hearing somebody there feels like at that time as your coaching career started there may have been when we think about the psychological side of the game and I'm making presumptions here but I just want to put this to you because I think it's it's a really interesting attitude towards psychological support performance psychology well-being mental health etc there feels like there may have been a tug of war perhaps back then when you started your coaching in terms of as you have, have said from an identity perspective I'm a farmer's son I'm you know, for me, that smacks of I'm tough minded. Mm. I, I I do this myself. I don't necessarily ask for help. I get on with it. Uh, and yet you had experienced sports psychology in the Australian national team, not always necessarily utilized it, but as you mentioned earlier, had had some pretty mind blowing reflections from the sports psych which i assume was the one that you related to us there well weren't you doing that anyway when you're playing for australia all that preparation <laughs> so it almost feels yeah. like as you started your coaching there may have been a tug of war in your mind in terms of the importance of sports psychology its delivery how meaningful that was to you from a from, from sort of an identity perspective but also something that you had been socialized more into because you experienced it Am I way off the mark there, or no? I think it's spot on. I, you know, there were much of my career I dismissed sports psychology uh, career as a player, uh, dismissed it as an important factor because I felt that um, you know I hadn't needed it to get to where I had, and and, and lying on a on a ground and and float listening to uh, someone talk about floating on a blue cloud <laughs> i don't do that adam let's just, just get that clear i don't do that <laughs> okay but anyway carry yeah. on sorry these were, uh, <laughs> these were some of the experiences that that i'd had um you know maybe to bring our arousal, arousal or levels of arousal down and get us relaxed uh for you know that was sort of my experience or, or sitting in a university classroom you know, got a bachelor of physical and health education so you know you, you have psychology 101 yeah and you get the theory and and it's not um well you, you you struggle to see how it relates but i was really um very fortunate um mm. in my coaching career and first of all I, I started at a hockey club in antwerp and i'd been doing coaching in schools and stuff like that in australia before i, ca I came and and um, there, of course, it's just a hockey club, and we had no psychological support. I was pretty much, I was actually the captain coach. Um, so I was not really even diving straight into only coaching. But when I began coaching the national team of Belgium, I was 31, and I was coaching some guys who were older than me. And I was, I was really lucky that I had a, a great mentor, and it's my predecessor in this role as, as performance director. His name is Bert Wentink. And um, Bert basically just said straight up, look, I think you know the game inside and out. You're a good tactician. You understand how to train a team. But I'm not sure that you have the skills to be able to manage a staff. And I'm not sure you have the skills to be able to manage the mental side of the game. So um, I would like to give you a mentor. And, um, and he had a short list of three or four people. And ultimately, I chose a guy by the name of Jeff Browers, and he's a, a psychologist here in Belgium. And um, and so I had him as a mentor, and also I inherited um, a, a full staff with the Belgian team when I took over, and that included a mental coach, and his name was Alain Goudsmet. And Alain had some pretty simple strategies and things that he wanted to explore with the team on the mental side. And so I was able to work with these two guys for four years um, and observe them working, ask questions, become comfortable with receiving feedback. And, and that was my first sort of really positive experience with psychology and, and mental coaching, if you like. And, you know, just a simple thing. I, I would do a presentation to, to the team and then they would give me feedback on how I presented 
uh, how I spoke, uh, the language that I used, the emotion that I showed, how I did that. Um, we, of course, you, you're coaching, you know, 27 athletes. You've got different um, situations coming at you every day uh, that, that you need advice from these particular gentlemen at the time. And they really helped me grow as a leader and, and I learned many lessons along the way there. And that was my first probably foray into um, the appreciation or the understanding the impact that the mental side of, of the game, uh, how important that is and how important that is for me as a coach, but also how important that is for, for the team and the culture around the team. And, and from there it's grown and, and I'm learning all the time. And, um, but that was the, the start of it. So from what you're saying, you're spot on, didn't value it. Then I'm like, wow, there's something in this. <laughs> and then going down the rabbit hole and, and, and really and learning uh, enormously along, uh, along the pathway of being a coach. You mentioned that you, know, you talked about uh, feedback on your communication skills. Um, you talked about managing staff and, and generally managing the mental side of the game you you used the word earlier a psychological word arousal but when you think of the mental side of the game what are what, what are the main words that come through to you the main concepts uh what what do you feel that you're dealing with and looking out for every single day as a, a as a coach it's a good question um you know in in modern day sport we talk a lot now around uh, you know culture of groups, um, performance, well-being, and um, trademark behaviours, uh, celebrating success, um, derailing behaviours, um, values. Value-based coaching is something that we try to work a lot with here in the Belgian Hockey Federation, and um, when I bring it back to you know putting things simply um, we want to have a look at uh, how we can create an environment where athletes feel empowered to bring their best qualities more often um, and they feel comfortable in the environment where they feel like yep yeah, I belong here I can do this and I'm going to bring these things and and have a really positive effect on the people around us so if we can as coaches and as leaders create that environment then i think um, um that's going to have a really positive impact on the the mental state of our athletes where they they actually want to be there because they they love it um and i have to say it, it's it's a real challenge and we don't always get it right um but um, yeah, that, that's how I, I, I see it. It's pretty broad. It's a very broad uh, subject, as you know, Dan. And um, trying to get it right is, is a challenge. But it, I hope that's uh, summed up ha how we, we try to set it up here or how I see it as a leader. Yeah, no, I, I love it. And, and, you know, you've mentioned those classic words of culture and well being. I like that term of trademark behaviors. Um, values um just on that notion of values because i miss you said that this is a big deal within belgium hockey and, and obviously respecting what you can and can't talk about um yeah um, because obviously there's always proprietary information within organizations but um again I, I, as you were speaking i was thinking of that juxtaposition if we're a values-based organization and we want our athletes to bring their best selves as individuals and you know coming back yeah. to your uh, appreciation of individual differences who sets the values because if we're top down we talked about this before in the sports psych show mm -hmm. when we're value based we could also be in danger of looking for uh, compliance and in danger of not respecting individual differences yeah it, it is pretty complex uh, first uh, to answer your question it needs to be a shared vision okay um we uh, with our youth programs, uh, it is maybe a bit more top down. Um, we have four values, and I can share those. It's written all over our building, so uh, it's not really proprietary information. But that's our values are team, 
uh, you, as in yourself, are yep. you developing, do you take responsibility, self-regulation, etc. Passion, so passion for the shirt and excellence. We call it the type values, T-Y-P-E. But what we do with all of our uh, youth teams every year is we go down through the exercise of what does team mean to you as a team? What does it mean to you as an individual? Mm -hmm. And we try to break it down so that, that they feel like they have some ownership of it rather than just that it's, it's forced uh, upon them. And to, to the point where um, you know, some of the teams take it further to say, okay, we've created our, our own ones, but they have to sit under the banner of, of type. And, and at, a, at, at the top level with our, um, our two senior teams, they, they have their own that they work together because I think it evolves with um, as the team evolves and as the people within the team evolves. Um, but um, the other thing that uh, we explore from there is um, not only yeah, what, what are the value or what are your particular values as an individual and how does that um, impact how you act and behave. But what we're trying to do as well is to bring self-awareness to, to everyone within our organisation, self-awareness to the players but also to our coaches about how they are, what are the things that they strongly believe in, what are the things that they value and why are they like that and how, does, how do those beliefs then shape the decisions that you make or the behaviours that you have as, a, as an athlete or as a coach and becoming really aware of that and then understanding the importance or the, that, that not everybody within that team or the organisation has the same beliefs and values. And how do we work together and how do we connect? Connection is, a, is another really important word that, that I use a lot with the coaches that I have and it's something that maybe I didn't do so well as a coach um, in my early years and, and maybe not even in my, my latter years around how do you build the connection with the people that you work with. That's something that I'm, I'm still working on, uh, someone that, that maybe didn't have that much importance on it in the past. I'd like to return to that word connection. If values lie at the heart of your culture and our capacity to live our values is based on, let's say, or is heavily influenced by self-awareness, as soon as you said that, and I'm probably not going to have a question here just to comment, as soon as you said that, it made me think of what's been worrying around my mind for the last few years is that as uncool as it sounds, I do wonder if great coaching starts with self-skills self-awareness self-control self-reflection self-development Chap chapter one of my next book i think Adam. <laughs> i'm i'm laughing because i'm like i wish or i hope that some of our coaches uh, listen to this because it, everything begins with yeah. yourself and um you know i i I always work with uh, mentors and I have different mentors uh, throughout different periods of my life and I still do now. But whenever I have a, a challenging situation, uh, one particular mentor says, okay, like how could you have done better before this to ensure that you don't find yourself in this situation right now? Uh, were the expectations clear? Did you have enough communication or connection with that particular individual? Um, so looking back at, at you know, that self-awareness of myself as a leader, and, and I think you're right, it, it does begin there. And, um, and then when you have that, how do you then, you know, look to build out the connections with the people that you work with? But starting from a understanding yourself um, a perspective first. As you were speaking there, it made me think of, I'm going to throw some psychological jargon at you here. Locus of control, internal locus of control, external locus of control. By that I mean, I suppose, as ascribing self as the most important factor in any relationship or situation. Looking, looking to yourself 
as a contributor to the situation, as the main contributor to the situation. And yeah. I've always, I've always felt, you know, building on what you said there, if, if I can become self-aware and engage in self-control and look at every situation, what, what can I do in this instance? I've always felt that that's quite a powerful position for coaches to be in because I do wonder if sometimes maybe historically where cultures have been maladaptive within sports, um, the coaching staff have had an external locus of control. Well, it's all about the players. The players have got to bring this and it's not about us. And maybe the players have had an external locus of control in as much as, well, it's about the coaches. Their coach, this isn't good enough. That's not good enough. It's all about what the coaches are doing. Whereas if you've got both sides, if you can do some mental gymnastics here, if you've got both sides have an internal locus of control, the coaches are saying it's about us. The players are saying it's about us. That's quite a powerful position on which to launch a collaborative coaching sort of partnership. Absolutely. Um, and if talking about, um, you know, awareness and conscious control, it's something that um, I quite often talk to our coaches about when we're debriefing a coaching performance. So I don't know if you've had that you know, concept. We debrief our athletes all the time, but do we debrief our coaches on how they performed during a match? And, and we try to do that as well. Um, you know, and, and I quite often say, okay, what, well, what was going through your mind when you were doing this? Were your behaviours conscious or were you just emotional because we, we conceded a goal or a, something happened that, we, that was unexpected? And provided that you are aware and you're conscious about how you're acting, how you're communicating, how you're behaving on the sideline uh, or at half time, or in a briefing or a debrief, um then i'm fine with it but if you are out of control and you are not conscious of of how you're behaving and you're just simply using emotion um uncontrollably then you know we need to try and improve that i would say because like it or not if you're standing still as a coach and you're being calm and you're you're not using any emotion that will have an impact on the players if you are showing a lot of emotion, that will also have an impact on the players. So are we conscious about what we're doing and are we aware of how that particular behaviour will impact uh, the players that are out on the pitch? With that in mind, what does a great coach look like? Well, I think uh, I I described it uh, just a moment ago with someone that is fully aware of, of... what they're doing and why they are doing it. And, and um, because, I, you know, I described a moment ago, you can be really calm, but there will be times where there might, you might need to display some emotion to show the players that you care, that it is important to you and that you're not a robot and you're able to just stand and be totally in control. Um, and and I, I think that... Um, uh, ensuring that the players understand why you are the way that you are and why you behave the way that you behave is also uh, important. And it could be, for example, that uh, a coach, uh, quite often I'm, I'm quite um, you know, interested when I see coaches on the sideline of uh, Premier League football and you know, you've got 80,000 people screaming and they're yelling at the players. There is no way the players are hearing them. <laughs> And so, who are you? Who are you yelling at? Um, and and of course, you know, if they're they're showing emotion and that gets the players to to get to the level that they need to, that that's fine. That's no worries at all. But um, equally, you have other coaches that sit very calmly, uh, almost in the stand, watching and and don't have much interaction at all. And and provided that the players understand why each of the coaches are doing that and that they are connected with that particular behaviour. Then, um, then I think um, you're on the the path to getting the best out of the team or the players on the pitch at that time. That's a really interesting thing you said there. So, if if we might briefly let's say let's not make any assumptions here, but if we reflect on let's say the uh, Italian uh, Spurs manager Antonio Conte, who's uh, can look very emotional on the sidelines. Going on what you said there, it, it, it could be that um, Antonio Conte would say, well, yeah, you look, at, I, 
I pretty much know that the players don't necessarily hear what I'm saying, but you know, the way I'm displaying my behaviors and expressing myself, that's important to me in my coaching. Those are the kind of behaviors I want to show because I want my players to have those kind of signals to influence their emotion. Absolutely. Um, Is that how you coached? Yeah, I was uh, I was someone that I went through a few phases uh, in my career. I think um, you know early on I was uh, quite vocal. Uh, in hockey, you can reach the players on the pitch. We don't have this huge crowd. You don't have the eighty thousand. No, you still have a few. But you know, at, at, if you're coaching in India, then then you do. Yeah. Um, and yeah. at, at Olympic Games finals, you do have large crowds. Yeah. And um, it's a really interesting one because I was probably someone that coached a bit on emotion in the beginning and, and really almost played the game with the team. And um, and that was successful, but, you know, after a while I think that, that wears off. And I, I remember it was something that I'll share with you. Um, when I started working with uh, the team in Australia, I wanted to, to have a sports psychologist uh, join the team and I and I had four main functions for the sports psychologist and the first one was to oversee the culture development of the group, uh, what are our values and the trademark behaviours uh, that I spoke about and how do these behaviours actually look uh, on the pitch and off the pitch, so what are the specific behaviours, so that was the first point. The second point was as individual psychological support for athletes, so to be there for our athletes. The third one was to be head coach support slash advice, um, give me advice, um, observe me and how I coach and, and to give feedback on, on my methods there. And the fourth one was to look at the staff dynamics, how do we work as a staff together and are we having a really highly functioning staff? And I probably didn't really hit the nail on the head there until I, I started, you know, a few years in, I, I had a good connection with the psychologist at the time, Darren Everett, and and he said, do you mind if I just stand next to you, next to the bench? He wasn't even allowed on the pitch at the time. We were only allowed to have a certain amount of staff. And he said, I'm just going to watch you and I'm going to, like, to take some notes um, and then we'll debrief it after the game. And immediately my pitch side manner changed. <laughs> right. And because I knew someone was watching me and they were going to, you know, if I carried on like a raving lunatic, then he would maybe um, give me uh, some, some advice that I, I didn't want to hear or some feedback that I, I would prefer not to hear. And so just by uh, being made consciously aware of how I w was acting, was really interesting that after the, the trip, the amount of girls that asked, what happened to Adam? Why is he acting so calm? We really like it. Can he keep doing it more? And so the impact on the, the players was, was actually really positive, more positive than when I was more emotional and um, well-received. And the, the feedback and comments that I subsequently got from the, the psychologist that I was working with was really positive about how I was doing. No, you're doing it fantastic and I just have a few small things. But <laughs> he hadn't watched me in previous tournaments where I maybe didn't um, behave in that particular way on the, on the sideline. It's so interesting, Anna, because as soon as you said I used to, I used to coach on emotion, <laughs> I immediately wrote down, well, how did you unlearn that? Yeah. And and so listening to what you're saying, just by just purely by observation, but the the threat of being observed, not necessarily the process of the feedback post observation, yeah. it's just the threat of being observed is enough for you to go, I need to adjust my behaviours here, and that's so fascinating, isn't it? And there's always like moments where you you maybe say something in the heat of the battle where you you re regret it as a coach, and you think. Mm the impact on that player was enormous and for you it was just like getting rid of some emotion and, and I had that um, in a previous trip and it was actually what prompted me to say, okay, I need someone to, to maybe keep me in check here. And it was it, it, for me it was a throwaway line. A player came and said, do you have any 
any feedback for me? And I said, well, you can start by trapping the effing ball. And, and then, then she went, okay, walked off. And, and then I thought to myself, oh, that's terrible. You know, that's, that's poor. And she came back and, and we, we sort of unpacked that. And I said, look, you know, get back to your basics and do these things. You're, it was one of our best players, you know. Yeah. Um, and she was just, she knew she wasn't performing and, and was probably just looking for me for a bit of comfort and, and help. And I, I, I smashed, smashed her down and made her even smaller at the time. And, and that was the moment where I said, okay, I need to take a look at how I'm um, communicating with, with the players at a particular moment where I myself feel under pressure and um and how can i handle that so that was a, a learning moment and yeah i think one that uh again being able to reflect on your own um behaviors and and being aware of that is is that's where it begins as we were talking about before therefore when you communicate with players now are you always as prepared as you can be for that communication moment? Is there any, are there any specific things you do that braces yourself for conversation with players? Look, uh, something that we've moved towards um, uh, in, in, in our environment now here in Belgium is really getting to understand each of the players very, very well. And what type of communication will help them in pressure situations and what type of communication won't help them. And so um, we're quite specific in the types of messages we should be giving each individual. And, you know, some coaches uh, might have a, uh, even like a, you know, a checklist of types of comments that they can give to, to each individual player in, in the heat of the battle and things definitely not to say in the heat of the battle to that particular individual and others might do it just like they're very they have a a really intuitive feel and they have a great connection already so they know or they have an innate ability to say the right thing at the right time and our previous head coach um Shane McLeod uh, he he coached the team uh, in the, the Tokyo gold medal game in the world cup and Euros, that was something, he had a wonderful connection with with most of the team. Probably not all, but most, I would say like 80%. And he was, that was his real strength. He is a wonderful tactician as well, but um, one of his real strengths was being able to connect with the athlete in the heat of the battle and say the right thing, which would get the best out of them when they went back on the pitch. I don't know if you know in hockey we we have rolling substitutions. Yes, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, that that rule changed a few years. Ago. Yeah, it, we, it, it, it changed uh, in two thousand, yeah. but um, okay. sort of it, it means that you have many coaching moments with athletes, um, okay. or the possibility for many yeah. coaching moments. I'd like to briefly talk about that in a second. You mentioned we tailor our communications to the individuals in our teams. Has it been doing psychometric tests in order to help you understand how to communicate with individuals or have you just asked players how they want to communicate, be communicated with? Uh, we use different uh, profiling tools, and but as with you would know, Dan, you know, that's just a, a starting point. Um, the real gold is the conversations that you have with the athletes after that yeah. and getting to understand them them better but it might give a, a, a nice little starting point where you can say okay from this you know th th this is how we think it might be best or, or what are your thoughts um you know and sometimes they say no nope, that's completely wrong <laughs> i would prefer this way and 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 that always overrules uh, any type of uh, profiling tool and just dwelling on the relationship piece, just returning back to something you said when you were observed, your coaching was observed, you, you, you know, you were on the sidelines, you were being observed, that shifted you in that moment or in those moments. And the feedback you got from the players was, was actually positive. Hey, we, we like this. It made, it made me want to ask you the question, as a head coach, 
Um, receiving feedback from players requires vulnerability and that can be scary for coaches because I think historically we've been socialized into quite a hierarchical structure. You know, the head coach sits mm-hmm. above and is all-knowing, all-seeing expert. Where do you sit with that, Adam, in terms of do you think coaches should seek out reflections on their coaching from players? I think you definitely need to be open to it. Um, uh, I think that um, if you've created a, an environment where everyone feels um, comfortable to communicate and to share the way that they're thinking and feeling, then I think that will happen organically and that's what you need to aim for. Um, did I or was I able to create that environment in, in the teams that I've worked with? Um, you know, I'd like to think that we were there, but the reality is that we probably weren't. Um, and and that's really what drives me as a, as a leader now in terms of trying to develop coaches is to, you know, I've got a picture in my mind about, what a really healthy environment looks like um, in terms of exactly that. Can athletes speak on the same level as the coaches? Can they contribute equally to the conversation around where we want this team to go and the journey that we want to take? Um, At what level do you take that? That's another uh, really interesting question. path to go down because you know you, you probably heard that you don't know what you don't know uh comment and and you know we have two very different teams in in belgium the the men's team uh has i think 10 players over 30 years of age okay um extremely experienced team uh you want to be drawing on their knowledge around how do you think we we're, we're best to go about doing this, this and this. You want to listen to them. Um, but our women's team have nine players under 21. <laughs> right. Now, are we going to be asking a 19-year-old to shape what our program looks like? Um, would that input be the same as a 35-year-old four-time Olympian repeat medalist? Yeah, I don't have the the exact answer there because, um, you know, you need to create an environment where that 19-year-old feels comfortable to talk because otherwise, you know, they will never feel comfortable. It will go, it will go, it will go, and you get a 30-year-old athlete that is sat there and say, okay, I've never been asked my opinion. Um, so at what point do you start getting feedback gathering opinions, creating shared visions, what does that look like? And and how do you as a leader um, help develop the tools within uh, your teams and within the athletes um, so that when they, uh, that they're always growing, they're always learning and, and you as a coach are learning from them. Um, I think something that I wrote recently really, and I believe, you know, I, I didn't believe in this when I was coaching, but now that you know, sort of six years of, of looking at this intensely, that it's not the 55-year-old head coach that is going to take the game to the next level. It's the creative 22-year-old genius that's come in and is doing things that we've never seen before. You know, they're going to take the, the game to the next level. So actually the the, the, the older generation at times you can be holding it back if you don't create this um, environment where athletes can flourish and be creative and innovate and you're not going to get that if you're not allowing these athletes to talk or to share their feelings or the way that they think the game should be played and so that's a um, a real challenge uh, for for leaders and coaches uh, in in all sports i think Listening to what you're saying that was making me think of the importance as a coach building the capacity to listen 
ask open questions and and also draw on expertise if they have to push back if they have to say i hear you i'm listening to you. i i hear you i love what you're saying about this yeah. this and this in this program here however we have to look at it in this other way because and probably drawing on principles of play and game models etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's that as yeah. you say there's that tension between giving players a, a, a voice and a say yeah. and the capacity to to flourish verbally and also action wise behaviorally playing wise but also there's got to be some lines and boundaries and borders haven't there just for the certainty of the team and the organization yeah, absolutely, and and even the language that you use there with your your example, I love what you're bringing here. The word love and the words that uh, feelings, uh, love, connection, that's different language, and will connect with athletes in a different way to you know process, continual improvement. Um, sticking to our trademark behaviors you know you hear the difference between that yeah. and understanding that is also really important as a coach you mentioned that in hockey now there's plenty of opportunities there's moments for coaching you've been a coach you're now high performance director of belgium hockey so you're essentially getting the helicopter viewpoint i would imagine a lot of the times and, and mm -hmm. you're looking on if i was or any of our listeners was to sit in the stands and watch your coaches coach and i'm talking really about training sessions here yeah what what kind of things would you want people to see from your coaches what kind of sessions do you do what behaviors do you want them to engage in? I, this i know and this is a very broad question but by and large when you think of an outstanding coaching session what does that look like to you look i think it's um it's important that there's a certain level of uh, flow and intensity i think there's uh needs to be a real connection between the person that is leading or the people that are leading the session and the athletes. So they're watching, they're engaged, they're um, certainly um, investing in, uh, in the session. And because there are some sessions, you know, that, that don't have that high level of intensity, that they're more w working on skill mastery. So, you know, maybe the, the technique side of the game where it might be lower intensity but you can still have the same level of engagement with your athletes. And um, I would like to, to see uh, variety in, in how you communicate, um, variety in, in exercises uh, and, and being creative in, in how you set them up. Um, but going back to that flow, it needs to be, you need to ensure that it flows hmm. and, um, yeah, I think you know, that's that's what I like to see, and and I like to see people, coaches, that are highly invested in the session as well. I think as coaches, we can quite often go through the motions. Um, I got a classic moment. I, I went to watch a training one day, and it was a bit of an impromptu uh, turn up and it was with one of our junior teams and we, we quite often use car tyres as obstacles to go around. And here was the coach, the head coach, sitting in the middle of the field, sitting on a car tyre, mm -hmm. umpiring the match. <laughs> and and I was thinking, <laughs> I took a photo of him and I said after the game, I said, what do you think about this? Yes, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> And I, uh, and I said, what's going on? He said, like, I'm, I'm on the pitch 45 hours a week, mate. I'm just exhausted. Okay. And, um, and then we explored um, why are you on the pitch that much and, and the challenges that we have in, in, in a sport that's not, you know, super professional and, and our coaches that are, you know, need to work these amount of hours to earn, earn a living. And, um, and then you talk about then about coach well-being. 
you know, and, and complacency and, and how do we get the best from you and how do you um, feel energised and, and ready to go when you come here? Because for me, I think um, coaching is also a performance and we need to, to turn up and be massively invested in, in what we're doing when we're there and it's got to be like you're preparing for a match and your match is every training session. My final question, but it won't be a question, it will be a comment and I'd love to get your, your thoughts. I'm firstly going to reflect back what I heard there. I heard, you know, we're talking about essentially sessions here and what you want to see. Now, it, it might be, I, as a psychologist, I have to appreciate cognitive bias. So because you're on the sports psych show, there might be a bias here. But you mentioned words like intensity and connection and engagement variability in activity and communication and I assume that has an attention and interest link personal investment and towards the end sort of alluded to well-being there so asking you as a high performance director what you want to see from your sessions there were a lot of psychosocial or biopsychosocial words there and so let me say this that at the heart of sport, at the heart of field hockey, at the heart of sport, lie the technical, tactical and physical components of the game. And nobody can deny that they lie at the heart of any sport. But the biopsychosocial or the psychology or the psychosocial component or components, might, whilst they might not be the most important, they should be put first because they are constant. They are always there the psychosocial psychology or biopsychosocial. No question, mate. Just a thought for you. And I would love any kind of comment, pushback, check and challenge from yourself or agreement. Well, I think it's undeniable that everything begins in the mind. You know, you, you get up in the morning and you can choose if you want to go to training or not. And you can choose how you turn up to training and, and you can... And from a coaching perspective as well, you, you need to be thinking about these things that, that I mentioned before to try to get uh, to create an environment where you're able to achieve some of those things, that, that engagement, that intensity, that flow, that connection. It's not going to happen just by putting some cones out on the pitch and some balls and saying, let's go for it. You need to just think with intent about how, what you want to achieve and how you might achieve it. Um, and, you know, we spoke about, you know, the importance of, of some technical, tactical, uh, physical aspects of training. But um, if you want everybody to be working together like a well-oiled machine, then you need to have a bit of think about how you're going to get that to occur as well. And, um, yeah, that's a, that's a real challenge in coaching, but one that I, I think is probably – the most interesting challenge. Great place to finish. Fantastic. Now, I know that you are um, on Twitter because um, we follow each other. So how can people follow you? How, how can they find you on social media? Yeah, just at Adam Commons, my name. Uh, that's uh, on Twitter. And uh, that's the main place where I share... Uh, coaching uh, philosophies, ideas, uh, ponderies. And, um, yeah, it's, um, it's uh, something that I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a, a big reader of uh, and follower of all things to do with sport, coaching and leadership. And um, have a follow and see if uh, you like what, uh, what I write every now and then. I'm, a, I'm a, an occasional tweeter. <laughs> well, you put some good stuff out there, so I can't thank you enough. And I can't thank you enough for your time today, Adam. So so thank you very much and, and the best for all of, of Belgium's activities on the uh, on the field of play over the coming year. Uh, thank you. It was a, a, a great to be on the show. Well, everybody, I really enjoyed that podcast. And I'd love to hear what you, the listener, think. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com to tell me what you think of the Sports Site Show, and I'd be delighted to hear any suggestions that you have. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.